Hello, and welcome to the Art Electrals Podcast. Thank you for listening and your continued support. When starting this series, I wanted to bring meaningful stories from successful artists to our audience as a means of inspiration and motivation. Being a musician myself, most of the interviewees have been a part of the musical realm in one shape or another, whether it being a performer, composer, or sound engineer. Each perspective on music was unique in its own way, and if you haven't seen or listened to those episodes, I'd highly recommend checking them out. One of many goals for this podcast is to hear completely different perspectives of the arts world. I think it's important for everyone to also learn about different facets of art because it offers community, inspiration, and purpose. Being open-minded about various forms of art is important because it gives our art a place and grounding. If we are not open about other things, then why should others care about what we do? So with that said, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce an interview completely different from our past episodes. The guest in today's episode is very special. Carla Segal was trained as a graphic designer and culinary artist and landed the dream job of working as part of Daniel Belude's graphic design team. For those who don't know, Daniel Belude is a French chef and restaurateur of more than 15 restaurants and establishments. He has received wide acclaim, numerous awards including Chef of the Year by Bon Appetit and the James Beard Award for Best Chef of New York City. In today's episode, we will hear wonderful stories about where Carla's career has taken her and transcend to another world different from our own. I hope you enjoy today's episode. I greatly appreciate it if you can rate this episode and perhaps even go the extra mile to leave a comment. You can check today's episode on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. You can learn more about Carla through her website, Agency, A G E N T S I E dot com, or follow her on Instagram at HungryCarly. Hope you enjoy this episode. Cool. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, you know, uh, you know, you're actually one of the first people who I'm t- I'm speaking with who's outside of the musical realm. So I'm very excited and I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you for including me. Yeah, uh, I would love to learn about this whole new world that I'm just, you know, I've been dying. I've, I've come through the, uh, the, the um, magnifying glass, but I haven't actually been involved in any respect. I like to cook, I like to, to eat, and I like to uh, enjoy, you know, the ambiance of nice restaurants, but, you know, I've never been involved. So just to, to hear your story about how you've, you know, transitioned from graphic designing, uh, you know, into the restaurant industry. I think that would be a really interesting uh, thing to hear about. Just, you know, you me- I remember mention- you, you uh, had in your bio, like when you were 13 or when you were a kid, you, you said that you, you're, you had the choice of eating in one place or the other. And, you know, you always had, I guess, a food, food uh, momentum going towards food, I guess. I did always, and I, I got that from my father, actually. He was very passionate um, about food and cooking, and he grew up in Queens, actually, and I think was exposed to a whole wide variety of foods and, and has subsequently exposed me to those foods. And I think mm-hmm. he is an adventurous eater, an adventurous diner, um, and I sort of caught that bug when I was younger. So to say, you know, the, the story you're mentioning on my sixth birthday to choose you know, whatever I wanted to eat. And that was Wendy's or sushi, (laughs) Um, you know, which has really sort of defined still my taste preferences now, like French fries and sushi are just my all time favorite foods. Um, But that high and low is definitely, you know, there's something of value at at every uh, price point and experience, I suppose. But um, yeah, my, my, my dad really sort of formulated my taste in food. And much like you, I think I'm just enamored of the dining experience certainly now there are so many amazing restaurants in new york and all over the country um and it's really become almost like a sport you know how many restaurants have right. you been to where are you going next have you are you following this chef and what he's doing you know it's just a whole um a whole other thing <laughs> so. wonderful have, has uh, any of your other family been involved in the culinary arts or around that area not not on any technical level. My dad is an excellent cook, I think, by virtue of trying to recreate the flavors that he tries when he dines out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I'm the only one who's really 
formalized my training. You know, I went to school for graphic design. I went to Syracuse University for that specifically. And I would come home from summer breaks and just try to do various different things. And one of my summer breaks from college, I went to culinary school and just explored the first, very first savory part of the program and the very first, you know, pastry part of the program to understand, Mm -hmm. is this something I like to do beyond eating, you know? (laughs) Eating is great, but like, what about (laughs) making food? Um, And I really enjoyed it and it happened to be right before my senior year and I thought, well, senior year is probably pretty important. So (laughs) I didn't jump ship just yet. Um, so I did finish college, um, and then I got formal training some years later, but did start out in graphic design. <laughs> cool, yeah. And I read that you were um, you were working for Scholastic at that point. I was, yeah. And actually, it was right after nine eleven. Um, so I was very happy to just get a job. You know, might I have wanted something in culinary at that point? Certainly, um, but it just doors were not open to almost anything. And New York was a very different place, certainly in the culinary realm. You know, you had to have a a background and experience and, you know, it was very hard to get that um, short of going to culinary school. So I was at Scholastic um, right out of college and I worked there for a number of years working in book clubs specifically. I don't know if you had that in your classroom where you could order through your teacher. Um, oh, yes, 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 yes. I remember. Most people have that memory. When I right. say book clubs, a lot of people don't know what that is. But then I say, no, you remember. <laughs> I remember the money orders. That was a thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It's a whole process. Right. Um, so I was working to design books that were featured in book clubs and working with artists and illustrators. It was fun for sure, but it definitely didn't sort of scratch that itch of my culinary passion. So I ended up going to culinary school while I was at Scholastic. I did it at mm. night. Wow. It was a slog for sure. Yeah, I, would, I can imagine just standing up for a few hours in the kitchen gives me a backache. So yeah, it's it very you. gratifying, though, you know, to know how hard you're you want something, how, how capable you are. Um, yeah. So that was it. that itch you said during that moment. What re- like was there a moment where it was like, I really got to jump for it, even though this is something completely out of the, the zone that I am used to? Yeah, you know, I think for lack of a better word, I said I was kind of bored. You know, I was in my 20s and I think I just needed kind of a kick in the bum, you know, like Mm -hmm. wanted to be shown the world the the hard way. And I think I just said, you know, sitting behind a desk at a big corporation is not for me, you know, and and I look back on it now and I could see that the experience afforded a lot, you know, certainly the security that comes along with a big company and you have 401k and you have a lunch hour and you (laughs) all these glorious things that are hard to come by now in in some respects. Um, But I really just thought like I needed to follow something that was really more deeply rooted in my interests and my passions. And I think I stepped back for a moment when I realized that that wasn't the right fit for me. And I I kind of made a mental checklist, like what what would I want out of a job if I'm really going to make a big shift? Let's talk about like what some of the pros would be. Um, You know, and I thought, getting to talk to and learn from chefs would be very cool. Getting to eat for free would ultimately be very cool. You know, whether or not these were realistic, it's like, well, we're making like a dream job list, you know? Um, And sort of playing up on my skills that I already had as being a graphic designer, I sort of assumed that all translated to food styling, um, Mm. which I rapidly found out is not what I wanted to do. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Just a very different... Uh, food styling, you mean like like designing what exactly? So food styling is really like the art of um, getting food set up for photography. So it's not always necessarily cooking food and plating and presenting food as you would eat it. It's mostly putting together food so that it can sit under lights and, and look a certain way on camera, which sure. is creative certainly in its own way. But right. what I came to think would be the right fit for me was plating and plating is not a career you know <laughs> right 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 it's well, very i do creative. see those videos with the glue and the, you know the cereal and everything and the right. cigarette exactly. smoke <laughs> exactly so it took me a little while to kind of figure out how to marry everything together once i left culinary school but that was kind of where i went into it my my plus and minus list you know and my thought of what it could be right so i guess it's good that you you've been able to you know, uh, be able to see those different angles of the industry and, and really get to know what you really like to do. So I think that's mm-hmm. important. That's great. Um, so you 
you got involved a lot with Daniel Baloo. That's that's the main that's like your your main thing that you've been doing before starting agency your your hospitality that's right. group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I spent um, a brief amount of time after culinary school working at a venue in Soho, mm -hmm. managing food and wine events. Yeah. Um, how did you get into there. that, actually? That would be interesting to hear. Oh, sure. You know, it came on Craigslist. It, it was just like looking for jobs in the culinary field. And the, the business actually was called the Culinary Loft. Uh -huh. And whether it was smart or not, I decided to make that jump from publishing to that particular job because the name of the business had the word culinary in its title. Mm -hmm. So if someone was looking through my resume rather quickly, they would see I went to culinary school and I worked at something that had to do with food. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so it, it was a step back in terms of pay from publishing, which you could imagine is already pretty low. Um, but I think, you know, there was a big opportunity to really make a shift. So I worked there for about a year um, and it was cooking class dinner parties, private events, you know, a lot of fun, very hands on. It was a small team of people. Um, so I definitely got my feet wet with regard to answering phones, <laughs> writing contracts, um, setting up for parties and ordering groceries, hiring staff, you know, wow. it really was kind of a first foot into um, what it is to host an event, a, a culinary event. Um, and I had been connected, you know, through my culinary school. I went to the Institute of Culinary Education in New York. Hmm. Um, they would send out just weekly, you know, job emails, which I always continue to read. And there was a, a huge paragraph, I remember reading it, about this special events position for Danielle Baloud's restaurant group. And it was, you know, within the PR department and they were expanding the department a little bit and looking for some event support and some graphic design support and all of these things. And I thought, I am this paragraph, <laughs> you know, by virtue of, of my training in both culinary school and college. Um, and then having had that first event planning job, it really sort of ticked all the boxes and I met with them. And we were just as taken with each other. It was like, how is this possible? You, know, <laughs> you have all the skills and you have all the things I want to learn. And um, I ended up getting that job and working there for almost eight years in various capacities. Um, but yeah, that was my, I guess, my first and only restaurant experience. And, and it, I will say it's my only experience because there's no one better to work for oh, yeah. um, than Danielle Baloud. Where do you go after that? You know, you absolutely. Already... <laughs> yeah, he's one of my favorite restaurants, you know, Danielle and... I've been there several times. If I have a big occasion, I always go to his establishments. And I mean, I always just like to go to different ones, but I'm disappointed. So I always gravitate going back because I think he's always been sustain like continuously uh, consistent. You know, whenever mm -hmm. I dine there, I've always been treated the same way. The food has always been fantastic. And uh, he's a nice guy. He's one of the nicest, probably nicest chefs I met. No arrogance, nothing. I, I remember walking past the cafe and he was just, he like I kind of said hi and he waved. And, you know, it's just little things like that. That, yeah, <laughs> uh, can definitely attribute to someone like him, and I saw some Instagram posts of his. Um, like he's very much um, uh, he he appreciates this, his staff. Like he was mm -hmm. he was saying, you know, really going through this time, difficult pandemic time, and they're all here, and we're you know setting up the terrace and everything, and you know that I really like his you know the way he treats his employees and everything. So. Mm -hmm. Just so listeners have a little bit of understanding who he is, because I'm sure not everyone has had the, the chance of dining there or met Danielle. So yes. how was your experience first meeting him? Did you meet him at the interview or was there? Um... I didn't. I didn't. You know, I it was still in the grand scheme of things, a pretty junior position. So you could imagine they don't waste his time too much with all the sure. interviews. Um you know, I don't remember the exact first time meeting him. I would imagine I was quite starstruck. I mean, he does have such an amazing energy. Mm -hmm. um, but I do recall so vividly having worked there for only a month or two. And this really speaks to his, you know, spirit of hospitality and, and generosity. Uh, you know, I'm from Chicago originally. And my father and stepmother had come to visit for the first time since I had been working for Danielle. And I just really wanted to expose them to who he was and what his restaurants were about. And at that point, he had three restaurants in New York, uh, Restaurant Danielle, Cafe Balloud, and DB Bistro Modern. Mm -hmm. And I had arranged for, I mean, I can't believe they accommodated this now that I'm saying it out loud, but I had arranged to have a progressive dinner where we had an appetizer 
um, at DB Bistro Modern, which was closest to my office. So they could come see my office. And then we walked over and had a first course at one restaurant. And then we took a taxi and we went to Cafe Balud and we had a main course at Cafe Balud. And then we finished the night at Danielle. And of course, everyone is incredibly gracious and we're having conversation. And by the time we ended up at restaurant Danielle, service was practically over. Mm -hmm. um, so they served us dessert and Danielle came out and my parents were like on cloud nine, you know, like we <laughs> took them back into the kitchen and the shift was over and they were, everyone was scrubbing their stations and eating sandwiches and he offered <laughs> them a beer and a sandwich. And like my parents were just blown away. And, you know, he spoke about me as if I had worked for him forever, you know, and my parents could not have been more proud or full, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and they just had the most wonderful time. And he really, he really embraces so much just the spirit of the whole industry, um, whether you work for him or not. I think those experiences are pretty common, even to people who just come to the restaurant and happen to find him in the dining room. So mm -hmm. it sure. was a really wonderful time. That's great. Wow. I mean, that's an amazing experience just going from different establishments to different. I mean, yeah. sure, it's, it took a long time, I'm guessing. And now that I'm saying it, I'm like, my gosh, I was ambitious and they were quite, you know, accepted. Blown away. Yeah, of course. <laughs> wow. I love that. And um, through your through your relationship with Danielle, have you been approached uh, by other uh, other establishments to 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 um, do similar work? Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the most valuable things about working for Danielle is sort of um, of course, to have that sort of stamp of approval that you're able to work, you know, with someone of his caliber, um, but also the amazing network of people who have worked with him and for him that you come into contact with and who go to all different parts of the country, um, whether it be to cook or to serve wine or open their own restaurants. So I've definitely been afforded um, just an incredible amount of opportunity by virtue of like the, the family tree. <laughs> Wow. Um, it's been a really great experience. I always am, you know, I'm forever joking that people in the restaurant industry were all the same kind of crazy, but people who work, you know, for Danielle were like, you know, we're cousins. <laughs> so <laughs> it doesn't matter if we haven't met, you know, if you're further down the family tree and you work for Danielle, like, oh, we're like fourth cousins, you know? Sure, sure. <laughs> That's great. Where, um, so where are some places that you've been taken by, by the Danielle, Danielle Blue team? <laughs> Sure. In terms of work opportunities? I guess. So or, was it all work oriented or were there some retreats or things like that? Um, you know, there certainly was a lot of travel afforded to me in my career. You know, I was working certainly um, in the latter years of, of when I worked at the Dynex Group. That's the management company um, for Danielle's restaurants. He had a number of locations uh, around the country and around the world. And my position had shifted from special event assistance and some graphic design, you know, a, a capacity to really being the creative director for the whole group. You know, the the economy shifted after um, 2008. So there was a, a more mindfulness to promote, you know, in a way that wasn't really something that happened, certainly for the more upscale brands before then. So print advertising, social media, you know, what the web presence was like is all something that blossomed um, you know, in the years that followed my joining the company. Um, so when my position shifted, there was a greater need to sort of establish the look and the feel and the tone of a whole lot more communication, both in print and digital, um, than there had been. So I had the opportunity to go, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure to all of his restaurants, actually, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Singapore, um, Miami, Palm Beach, uh, quite a number of them and, and really incredibly talented people, you know, teams serving in all of those places. So it was really kind of amazing. And I will say, you know, of course, these weren't vacations. I wasn't, you know, um, on the beach in Miami or <laughs> any of those things. They really were work trips. Um, right. But it was really just an incredible experience to see all those places and certainly to see how, um, you know, someone with Danielle's reputation is presenting themselves and their brands in those various locations. You know, there are people who know who he is instantly and there are people who do not. Um, and, you know, they, there are certain expectations that come along um, with his style of service and, and his being French. Um, but, you know, how you balance that with where you're opening a restaurant is, is a pretty different experience depending on the market. So it was a nice exploration of his brands, you know, across all of those places. 
Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. Just hearing that he has so many places and you've been able to, to have your, your foot in the door in that, in that regard. Um, actually, I went to, um, I knew, you know, Dominic Ansel. You've probably, yes, so yes. I, I remember actually going to his, uh, I mean, his attitude is very similar in that regard. Like, uh, you know, he's branching out his, his business and also thinking outside of the box and, and catering to the needs of different countries. Like, I guess, I think he, um, he opened his store in in uh, Asia, one of his yeah. next branches. Yeah, he so, had one in Japan, I think, right? Right, and he catered to that local team as uh, local uh, people there as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just interesting that we all have different markets, and the way in which we do things in one place does not necessarily work in another. Exactly. So, um, exactly. Great. How did you um? How did you work between like? So you weren't in charge of like the social media aspect of things. How were were you like working with the teams? Like how was that? Sure. You know, I, it's interesting. My time with the company, I feel like there was some transition just in terms of the overall importance of social media in general. Um, and sort of the outlook of the company was shifting as social media itself was shifting. And, you know, I think it went from being a very personal thing, you know, like college kids using Facebook to connect with each other, and then where it shifts into businesses and media using social media to promote themselves, um, I think was, was happening all while I was there. So, you know, I did have my hands in a lot of different things. I would say a majority of my work was branding and print print work, you know, there was a lot of promotion um, as relates to just the business of getting diners in the restaurant. You know, there are, you know, internal promotions that a restaurant might develop for hours where business is kind of soft. And then there are, you know, bigger citywide promotions, something like restaurant week, where you're trying to expose yourself to new clients. Um, so a lot of my work was focused on communicating that. Um, and I do think sort of, you know, after my departure, they have really grown their team to include, you know, social media specific, content specific sure. um, people. But in, in my day, it was, you know, I, I wore many hats, as did everyone in the PR department. My, my former um, boss there, a woman named Georgette Farkas, used to joke that she was the PR director and the dishwasher, you know, and everything in between. You know, you pick up the phone and you just don't know what you're going to get, but you're going to figure it out. <laughs> Um, and where do you see more young people entering the doors after that social media frenzy, uh, uh, you know, time happened? You know, I think so. I think that there was just so much happening at once. I think too, you know, as we were talking about when we started, um, discussion that the restaurant industry itself is really changed so much and that things are very fast. And, and I think that is in part due to social media, people taking pictures of their food, um, you know, wanting to keep a running list of where they've been and show people what's happening in real time and be the first and be the one sharing that experience initially with someone. Um, you know, so I do think there's a, a much younger audience. I, I would say it's in part to social media and in part to marketing on social media, but I think it's also just the nature of the scene in all of these cities. Sure. And uh, so when you were doing like private events and parties, um, what were some of the highlights you would say? I'm sure you had many, many, but were there any specific ones where you're like, wow, this is, I'm so happy I'm part of this world? Oh my goodness any number of things. You know, I think uh, there were a lot of events that we hosted specifically at Danielle's Restaurant Group on behalf of City Meals on Wheels. Um, that is a charity that is near and dear to Danielle's heart. And he actually, you know, his restaurant, um, Danielle, is not open on Sundays, but one time a year he would host this large, large, large event on their behalf on a Sunday. And the whole restaurant group would really come together to support it. And he would always have guest chefs um, come and support and there'd be a big auction and you know it was like a very relaxed casual kind of Sunday in blue jeans at restaurant Danielle but I always felt like those weekends were magical not only for whoever um, was taking part in the event that year people would fly from Europe to cook you know very special um, dinners for sure but um, also, some of the things that were represented in the auctions, you know, I had occasion to meet Chuck Close, um, just some really amazing, you know, people in the wow. same room together, uh, always felt very special to be part of planning that certainly to be there. And then, of course, to be able to say that you raised, you know, almost a million dollars for charity, you know, is, is all good feelings. <laughs> sure. And I know that City on Wheels, I know Eric Repair. 
Uh, okay. I guess he's Le Bernardin's uh, chef. He, uh, yeah, he's a big on that as well. I see him on social media always promoting. So, like, what happened? Uh, so, what got you to the point where you decided to branch off from from the Daniel Balut industry into sure. your own thing? Sure. You know, I think. Just in, as I was saying, you know, the structure of the company and the shifting of the industry, it felt a bit to me as if I had probably reached as far as I was going to go um, within the Dynex group at that point. And, you know, I, I think I was, again, looking for that challenge, as I mentioned when I was in publishing, like looking for that little fire. Um, at that point, you know, I was still executing branding and design work and rather than affecting um, new brands and new restaurants. You know, Danielle's strategy was to open second and third locations of existing concepts. And I think for me, creatively as a designer, um, you know, it's a it's a different effort that you put forward in terms of producing something that already exists and, and tweaking and changing as opposed to establishing something from scratch. I think that creative process is a little more interesting um, and keeps you sort of fresh and on your toes. Um, so those opportunities, I think just by virtue of the strategy of where the company was at at that point were few and far between for me. Um, and I did spend a good deal of time just questioning where do you go from here? <laughs> you know, like you don't Absolutely. just go to another restaurant group or work for another chef. Um, so I really kind of honed in and thought, well, if I'm going to do something, I think it should be me going out on my own and really trying to establish a business for myself. And I would much rather, you know, if I was going to end up in the HR department of some company two years down the road, have said, I tried working for myself and here's why that didn't work or here's why I feel I would rather be working for your company instead of saying, well, I left Danielle's group and then I went to this other place and it didn't work out so well and now I'm in your office, <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, so I made that leap with that in mind. So you're, you're a risk taker in that regard and you, you're open to, to just putting yourself out there and you know, that's props I to you for that. So. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been uh, running agency for? Uh, it's been five years, uh, which has been incredibly slow and scary and fast and amazing all at the same time. <laughs> um, I think I don't know if running your own business ever gets easier. You know, the ebb and flow of, oh, my God, I have more work than I can possibly accomplish. And, oh, my God, where has all the work gone? You know, <laughs> right. As a business owner myself, I had that same these same kind of moments, you know, in the beginning it was was scary, you know, putting money out there, designing a website, uh, paying for advertising, and then and then a year later, I had six weddings in one day, and I was like, "What do I do now?" Oh, you know. But I had to contract oh. a lot of musicians. You know, I know them over the years because I went yeah. to you know I have a musical background in New York predominantly, so I understand those uh, you know those high and those lows. I went to China uh, a year ago and did a tour yeah. there with 20 concerts and you know just being able to do all those things and then and then sit quiet for a minute and you're like where's everything you know so right. i think that's the same thing in a way with the pandemic here's like the quiet before the storm perhaps you know yeah. i feel like a yeah. lot of rescheduling is going to be happening in 2021 for sure yeah. um but it's it's amazing uh have you so how um what kind of clients have you been getting from agency and are you still doing the same kind of work you've been doing danielle in, in the regard of design or have you expanded in that regard sure you know when i left danielle initially i did take on some social media clients just you know with that change in the landscape um and certainly my passion for social media as you know and you've been following me um and, you know, I came to find that social media for me is really more of a personal passion and that doing it on a professional level requires so much um, explanation, <laughs> you know, certainly for, you know, clients who may not be as versed in the ins and outs of what it takes to put together a post, but then to follow up on, you know, the traction of how many people saw it and how does that translate, you know, into um you know, butts and seats in your restaurant. Uh, it took a lot of reporting and sort of backing up and it wasn't quite as fun as I anticipated. So I have shifted back toward really managing branding and design work, um, which I think is my strongest suit anyway, you know, um, 
I like that there is a certain set parameter of what you're doing, um, whereas social media is constantly shifting, the rules are changing and the algorithms are are different. You know, one day you wake up and your whole job you have to figure out all over again. And I thought, oh, that's not for me. <laughs> no, sure. It's a crazy um, world. Instagram control. It's It was a different world when it just when it was just launched. Now it's yeah. a it's it, like it's a, a small fish in big waters. Other can of worms. <laughs> It's useful, so. though. I think it's useful for showcasing clients. But in terms of getting clients, I'm not so sure unless you're so consistent and it becomes like a job in and of itself. Right. So. right. I do think it's important to have that presence and, and to have that be something that's well done. Um, but it was not I, I decided it was not in my wheelhouse <laughs> after right. after about a year. I thought, well, let me just focus. And I think, too, you know, when someone's coming to you. Um, and when a client is coming to you, I think it's a good thing to have, you know, a somewhat narrow focus of what you're offering so that you can be expert in that area and not jack of all trades, you know. It's true. Um, so I've taken some comfort in the fact that this is what I do and I do it well and that's enough. <laughs> sure. Great. What um, I just like to get a little bit into the nitty gritty about the graphic work design that you're doing and uh, in terms of branding and everything else, just to, to learn a little bit what exactly that role is and what your a day in the life of a busy uh, Carla would be. <laughs> <laughs> a busy, and not, a, not on one of those slow days. Um, sure, a busy day. You know, I think it's helpful to kind of understand the bigger picture of some of the project work that I do. You know, if I am approached um, by a restaurant, by any client really, but mostly by restaurants, um, I have kind of developed like a three-tier um, project package that I work through with people. So we would initially develop what their um, brand is, you know, talk about what they're, what they stand for, what they hope, what their hopes and dreams are, you know, what their client, client base is. Um, certainly anyone in the same space that's doing things that they appreciate for a variety of reasons. Um, and then work with them to develop the look and feel of what that brand is. So developing a logo, you know, as part of that, any uh, colors, fonts, you know, things that go along with how you would communicate to someone and all, all those things together to make up sort of the, the visual brand package. Um, and then from there, you know, we would work towards print applications and digital applications, you know, print being um, in a restaurant case, you know, menus, wine lists, um, hopefully those don't go away after COVID, but <laughs> um, certainly even digital versions of those, I suppose. Um, but then too, you know, email templates and websites, if there are social media graphics or um, profile pictures and icons, you know, all of that stuff needs to be thought through, um, hopefully, thoughtfully from the beginning. Um, so often I'm working with restaurants or food clients um, in support of, of that effort. And, and sometimes, you know, brands might come to me and have an established guide and they're just looking for someone to help them communicate more recent news in a certain way if it's, email blasts, if it's brochures, you know, things of that nature, then I can kind of dissect, you know, their existing brand materials and help them to continue to present um, print and digital materials to their client base um, that looks and feels cohesive. Um, so it, it, it runs the gamut, you know, whether I'm starting with a client from scratch or kind of picking up some of the pieces, you know, as, as things change, um, that's sort of the nature of what I'm doing. Sure. And and when it, uh, do you ever have a moment where you see the menu and you're like, do you ever feel it necessary to put, you know, put forward some ideas of your own or that's just totally not what they're asking for? And, you know, that's uh, I, I think it depends on on the nature of the conversation and communication. You know, if, if I'm in a restaurant um, and see something that I might do differently, I don't often take the step. Um, to say something, if it's a client and I'm working on, you know, one portion of their brand, whether it be for budget reasons or, you know, they've come with one thing that they think is needing a refresh and there are other areas that I might, you know, I might, I might suggest some things. Sure. Um, so it's just, you know, it depends on the nature of the, of the client, of the conversation. Um, but I'm, I think part of why people enjoy working with me is that I do speak my mind and I am pretty honest about my impressions. Um, you know, certainly in this landscape where there are so many restaurants, um, you know, I think it's pretty important to put your best foot forward. Uh, 
both in digital and print, you know, every little thing makes an impression now. And even before people are coming to your restaurant, they're forming an impression. Um, so in as much as I can help um, to do that, I do. Great. Where, um, where do you think that things will go with the pandemic? Uh, now that things are shifting, I see some more outdoor options and, and uh, I know that some restaurants are taking things to the Hamptons, but that's not going to be, it's not going to be summer forever. So I'm right. just wondering what is the, uh, what do you think, what is something that you've heard or, or ideas that you think would be working for, for these restaurants in the future? I, to make you know, it this really... is such a good question. And I, I admit I do not know, certainly as things get colder, you know, I keep discussing with my husband, as much as I love restaurants, I still haven't dined out, you know, I'm trying to be very protective of my health and that of my um, older parents. So uh, as much as I can support from home, I am, we order, you know, a couple times a week from our local places and um, are making efforts in that way. And I, you know, I do hope that certainly restaurants that have the ability to really ramp up their delivery service, you know, be creative with their offerings in a way that they can reach out to people in their homes um, as the weather gets colder. I think that will be important. Um, you know, I'm seeing more and more restaurants that are using QR codes that you scan your phone and read the menu on your phone. So you're not touching anything at the table. There's no common menus or anything of that nature. You know, I could see that continuing into the fall and beyond, you know, it'd be very interesting to see what steps are taken during the pandemic that just carry through as common restaurant experience from here on. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I see, um, you know, Chef Ackett's uh, of Alinea, mm -hmm. he, he's doing more like uh, take home kits and things like that. So that's been pretty interesting. And I think that maybe that would be a good idea, getting, you know, consumers also to learn in the process of, of this as well. Right. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, it'd be great to get some, some uh, last thoughts about uh, some, what are some things you would recommend to aspiring artists? Uh, it doesn't have to be specific to uh, the food or restaurant industry, but just a general uh, comment for that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think your observation was a good one just to, you know, be fearless and try different things. And if something is feeling boring or stagnant or not the right fit for any reason, try something else um, or, you know, and do it in your free time. It doesn't have to be as dramatic a shift as some of the ones that I've made in my career. Um, but, you know, just exposing yourselves to some things that are different, I think, is important. Um, you know, even in my time in design school, I was very regimented in working with a computer just by virtue of my major. Um, and in my mind, the complete opposite of that is painting, you know, where you have very little control over the materials. And, and certainly if you're very good at it, you would know which way maybe the brush is going to go and how much liquid you can push a certain way. But to me, that was terrifying the idea of painting <laughs> but I think sure. it's good to kind of take those leaps and understand you know maybe where you fail even is is very important so I think it's important to try new things even if they're not the right fit sure that's a great <laughs> point um yeah and actually I'm curious what are your uh totally out of the subject but what are your some of your your favorite foods and what what's like the a dish that you would say or a few dishes that really pop out in your mind where you're like oh, that has yeah. Send me to heaven. Uh, aside from sushi and French fries, <laughs> um, my two, my top two favorites. Um, I really am always interested in trying things that sound very different, um, whether it be by virtue of preparation or ingredient. You know, I um, I think back to a dining experience I had here. There was a restaurant called Moto in Chicago. So you know, it was kind of when Alinea and was coming up. All of this. Um, uh, molecular gastronomy was very popular and had this whole menu of food to choose from. And I remember coming back to see my friend afterwards and show her the menu. And she said, Oh, I know what you had. You had this, this, and this, cause those sound weird. <laughs> you know? right. and I thought, she knows me so well, but it's true. If it's awful, if it's, you know, some mix of flavors that sounds just different. A lot of times I'll end up ordering things just out of curiosity, really more than, um, you know, coming back to a favorite ingredient or preparation. You know, I think there are, of course, some homey things that everyone's going to love. Their mom makes a great meatloaf, so you want to try this meatloaf. But I think more often than not, I'm, I try the things that I can't do, and I don't know what that tastes like. Right. Awesome. <laughs> what, um, what countries have you traveled to where you experienced a lot of that uh, new cuisine 
that you yeah, haven't had? Yeah, sure. Before? I've had I've I've been to Korea, South Korea. It's really interesting foods there, and I think I still am enamored. You know, Korean food. Um, I think that's my number one go to if we're dining out or ordering in. So I'm like, well, we could have Korean again. <laughs> yeah, been, uh, Youngsik, right in New York. That, I like that yes. restaurant. That's have you oh, been there? Oh gosh, that's well, yes, yeah. So many great um but you know the flavors of korean food are always really intriguing to me and certainly in combination um you know with other cuisines there's a restaurant here in chicago called pasaroto that is combining korean and uh italian and i okay. think they've done it really well um preparing some gnocchi and some you know different things where they're kind of marrying techniques and marrying flavors yeah it's like um, momofuku nishi kind of uh with yes, the i've never been there but yeah exactly i think yeah. there are some interesting intersections between some of these cuisines where you can kind of blur the lines where it's familiar both as italian and and korean um, and i've enjoyed those experiences a lot that's awesome love it <laughs> Uh, like the movie in pa Parasite, that, that noodle dish, it, it comes yes. to mind. It's not Italian probably, but, you know, I'm just thinking about it. The yeah, well, there's actually now. a Korean restaurant here called Perilla that, it, you know, when everyone was getting creative with their pandemic delivery options, they, they would send you everything. Those two packages of noodles, the steak, you know, and like a little recipe card, and you could make that dish from the movie. And I thought that was so smart and yeah. probably not that much effort for them. And here they are playing into an audience of people who love Korean food and people who'd seen that movie and I love <laughs> people that back idea. at home. Sure. <laughs> no, that's amazing. That's actually a great idea to kind of have more, um, you know, little things in the box, you know, mm -hmm. when you get a delivery, just not mm -hmm. you're just, here's your food and eat it and buy it again from us, but, you know, really supporting and thinking outside the box and that's branding, right? Exactly. So, um, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carla, for your time. And sure, thank you, you for having me. I so appreciate nice to talk to you. good to talk to you too. And, you know, it'd be great if you're in New York, you know, let's get, let's grab a lunch or something. And I will be, know. and we will. <laughs> awesome.